spawning Newcastle, virtually. Who's actually in Newcastle? It's Sam, you up there? Close enough. Close Near enough. enough. <laughs> I can probably see it if I stood on the roof. So it's it's kind of more of a global B sides, isn't it? I think probably one of the first in the UK, if not the first in the UK. Um, Bear farmers, please all unmute your microphones. We are a, we are go. Really? We are go. Mm, um, exciting. This is pretty cool because it's um, one of the very few talks we've given when every member of the bear farmers is actually here. Yep. And um, so that's really neat. We even managed to dust John off, which is really, that's not a euphemism, by the way. Um, <laughs> but we managed to bring him out of hibernation for an hour this morning, which is really super cool. Right, I'm going to share my screen and you're going to tell me it's working. Oh, you should have killed that URL. All right. <laughs> Are we good? Yeah, man. Good. Up. All right. So the title of our talk um, that we've lovingly prepared for you for this morning um, is if history teaches us anything, it's that we ignore it. And that can be said of many, many things um, across history. And it's a reflection on the things that have gone on in the past that seemingly still go on today and have never really been fixed, despite the fact that we endlessly talk to each other about them and agree and disagree and come up with solutions. But we don't seem to ever solve the problem. So that's the general idea of your talk. It's probably going to run 45 minutes to, to an hour, but we'll see. I think we've got somebody curating questions in Slido, is it? And so if you've got a question to ask, use that app or use the site, and we'll get to those questions at the end. If you haven't got any questions, then great. Fantastic. We've, we've delivered a perfect presentation. Just a quick one. The Slido uh, code, I think, hash NCL20? 2020. 2020. Yeah. So that's, that's hash NCL 2020, just to be clear. Okay, cool. All right, <clears throat> let's crack on. Okay, so we are the bear farmers. I think many or most people have heard of who we are. We are a, a troop of uh, infosec professionals. And up until recently, we rocked around the UK delivering talks about topical things. Um, <clears throat> had a good time, met lots of friends, and now we're doing it all virtually. But that's kind of cool. All right, so on to the obligatory parental advisory. So we do occasionally tend to use colourful language in our talks. Uh, we don't do it gratuitously, particularly now that Andy Gill is no longer a member of the Bay Farmers. So there are probably going to be virtually no C-bombs dropped. So for anybody um, that's offended by the use of that word, we'll probably avoid it. But we might swear a little bit, but again, we'll keep it in context of the talk. All right, so who are we? So we're going to do a quick, really quick round robin of who we all are. Um, so I'm Mike Thompson, AppSec Bloke on Twitter, and uh, you can unfollow me as you see fit, block me, mute me, report me, all that kind of thing. I've seen it all before. Um, I'm uh, head, of IT, uh, head of IT security for uh, an ISP in the north of England. I will hand you now to John. I am John from Belgium. So... Uh... Yeah, far away, <laughs> but uh, this makes it really easy to to join conferences. So, really enjoy that I could make it. Uh, it's not always that easy. Um, uh, yeah, from Belgium, I'm an AppSec guy and nowadays a security manager. Over to Ian. Hey everyone, I'm Fat Hobbit, percussionist of the Beer Farmers. Mostly cowbell, but sometimes people's faces. <laughs> Scott. Over to you, Scott. Thanks, Ian. Uh, I'm Scott. Um, many of you may have already blocked me on Twitter, and that's absolutely fine. Uh, I am the newest member of the Beer Farmers, so I'm kind of on probation, so I don't really want to say too much, but there will be lots of colourful language from me. Uh, over to you, Sean. I'm last on the list. Much to my delight. Always but closest nice. to my heart, Sean. <laughs> <laughs> um, I am Sean. Uh, yeah, uh, I'm... AppSec kind of lead, leading up uh, uh, the AppSec in Immersive Labs. Um, big fan of application security um, and I'm proud to be part of the beer farmers. Well said that, man. <clears throat> All right. Let's kick off with the, the main meat of the talk. So anybody that knows who this guy is, well, they'll tell you that that's a Napoleon Bonaparte. And during his reign... He had a really great idea, and his idea was that he will take Russia, take its land and its natural resources, and then France would have a, an empire, a huge empire, and be rich. The thing is, he didn't realize how cold it is in Russia at the time of year that he invaded. 
And so they went steaming in and then realized it's a bit cold and then failed. That's pretty much what the outcome was. Okay. That was a bad idea. Invading Russia has historically never been a great idea, and I don't think anybody's really ever succeeded. So winding on to the 1940s, and this group of really lovely chaps, and you'll notice um, Adolf Hitler, Joseph Goebbels, and Hermann Goering in the front of shot, they devised a similar plan, which was we will take Russia, uh, own its lands and all of its natural resources, and it will build part of the Reich that's going to last a thousand years. And guess what happened? They all got froze to death because they picked the wrong time of the year. They didn't um, factor in that the Russians have got a pretty good idea of how their winters work. And many, many German soldiers um, froze to death in the process. And interestingly, a little anecdote, Goering, who's on the left-hand side of Hitler, or the right-hand side of Hitler, from Hitler's point of view, um, was head of the air, or head of Luftwaffe at the time. And he organized an airdrop into Stalingrad and... The German soldiers were expecting to receive supplies and ammunition, but what they accidentally received was um, tons and tons of condoms. So that didn't work out too well because what the Russians did was collect the condoms up, fill them with petrol and use them as parts of Molotov cocktails. So that didn't work out too well. Oh, those pesky Russians. I know. Ian, you're, you're a wartime buff. Do you want to just reflect yeah. on some of this stuff? Sure. So um, there's a lot of uh, things and, and this picture, you know, a little bit controversial, but... Um, a bad plan doesn't work without great public relations PR behind it and marketing. And one of the reasons why I wanted to have Joseph Goebbels in this, in this shot was that Hitler's ideas only came to life when they were amplified through social media. And if you can't see a parallel between the rise of fascism uh, and nationalistic movements, and the idea that we would be better off ununified, um, I think you're failing to see the point. To contextualize it in InfoSec terms, and we'll open it up to the rest of the beer farmers on this one. About 2015, we got hit with the first strains of CryptoLocker. And pretty much every journalist, every information security specialist was like, this is going to be a thing, okay? Uh, five years later, it's a huge thing. And um, a, a report came out from the company I work uh, at is that I believe we've now identified over 39 different uh, professional organized criminal groups uh, hitting businesses with uh, a version of ransomware. Uh, in a lot of cases, a version of ransomware plus blackmail. And, and so back when we look at 2015, uh, we knew that security was become important because all of a sudden on our computer was flashing up a screen that said, you need to pay us $200 and we'll unlock your computer. Fast forward to where we are today and companies are spending uh, literally millions, and I'm not exaggerating that, to get their data back from what is essentially the same threat in 2015 as it is today. So, you know, I'm almost throwing up my hands in despair because this is the equivalent of, you know, invading Russia and not learning from our, our, our mistakes or even the mistakes previous in history. John, do, do you have some thoughts you want to go for there? Yes, uh, you're, you're totally right. It's, it's, it's like, yeah, the basics totally not governed by companies. It's not only ransomware, of course. But 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 we see it over again, and what, what what's typical for now is, is what you notice is the extortion part. So not only have we encrypted all your files and your systems, we have your data and we will leak it. So yes, it, it's not anymore like, hey, I have the backups and I can recover. It, it, it's another level now. But that's also not new. We saw that with 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 some operators, some some groups. And companies are still not prepared. They know it's going to happen sooner or later, but they're not prepared. So totally agree about the ransomware, but yeah, it's a lot of things. We, we keep on making the same mistakes and we literally don't learn anything as it seems. Some companies do, but a lot of companies fail to, to learn from uh, mistakes from others or even their own mistakes but, if they get I, hit several times. I just also want to add, like some companies get hit more than once. So single companies themselves aren't even learning. They get breached and they get breached again and maybe a third time and you'd think they'll take the hint, but they still don't. 
Well, it's that that age old adage of uh, it's cheaper and easier to pay the parking fine in London than it is to actually pay for parking. Like they're 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 literally just focusing on, hey, if we get breached, and I'm sure we're going to come on to this later. If we get breached, we'll just pay the fine because it's slightly cheaper than actually patching our systems, actually doing the due diligence, actually putting things in place and hiring more staff. That costs 10 times more than just paying the ICO's pissy fine, if I'm perfectly honest, if they even bothered to do anything. Well, that would go, that would, pre-2018, Scott, in terms of the ICO, that would be absolutely correct. You know, we look at the... Um, the fine that Talk Talk got for their data breach, which was four hundred thousand um, pounds. Yeah. Wind forward to the fine that BA have been issued notice of intent from the ICO, and I think that's one hundred eighty-three million pounds. So yeah, just no difference, magnitude. really. No difference. <laughs> um, I want to jump in though with something too, because this is sort of like a state of of the art here. So you may think that a ransomware attack is a very sophisticated attack. Uh, it is not. It's commoditized. There's ransomware as a service that is essentially cyber criminals building better and better ransomware that then is basically commercially available to anyone that wants to uh, that wants to embark upon that road. Uh, I wrote an article about probably about two weeks ago that looked at um, a uh, indictment that was handed down from the Department of Justice, and at the time of this guy's crimes, he was 14 years old. He used SQL uh, map to discover a SQL vulnerability in Armor Games. He was able to gain access to uh, and then uh, exfiltrate the data and convince uh, the, the, the uh, Armor Games to pay him a ransom. When they uh, said, when they dithered, he took their s systems down and essentially held them hostage for a couple of days before they restored those systems, right? With the same SQL map vulnerability that he had used previously to gain access, okay? So, so this, is, this is sort of the, the whole thing that, and, and really underscores the point that we're trying to make here is that um, this cycle of perpetuating the mistakes like you would have you should have learned that you have these vulnerabilities the tools to find vulnerabilities like sql map are readily available and the fact that it appears more criminals are doing that and finding those vulnerabilities and exploiting them than blue teamers really becomes that demoralizing uh piece i'd add every single security incident a learning opportunity i meant to that oh yeah High five, virtual high five. <laughs> and as this man said, Albert Einstein, um, insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different outcome or a different set of results. And that's kind of the whole thing in a nutshell, really, everything we've just spoken about. <clears throat> so, Ian. Yeah. These next couple of slides are all on you, buddy. Okay, so so this is a really interesting kind of situation that has developed. Um, so you, you guys may have been familiar with uh, the Uber data breach um, in back all the way back in 2016. Well, the slow wheels of justice uh, turn, and one Joseph Sullivan, who's a senior executive, I believe he was CIO of, uh, of Uber, um, he essentially paid the hackers who had exfiltrated about 600,000 driver's licenses uh, and information from Uber systems. He essentially paid them a uh, million dollars uh, from a bug bounty um, program. So facilitating the use of a bug bounty vendor to pay these guys that have broken into Uber a million dollars and then attempted to put them under NDAs, okay? And the idea was is that basically he was going to conceal this data breach, right, from, from everyone. He put his own staff under NDAs. He was very careful to not give any of the details of the data breach to um, corporate counsel. It was really him and the CEO that conspired to do this, right? Now, let's back up a little, a little bit. Um, Uber is a company that is essentially trying to build autonomous vehicles by using human drivers up until the point their autonomous vehicle technology takes flight and they unemploy all the humans, 
Okay, so they're using humans to eventually replace humans. So that's the ethical center of Uber. Okay, now where Joseph Sullivan ran into a foul, shall we say, was that in the United States, when you're a publicly traded company, you need to disclose things that are material to your organization, including cyber uh, activity. Uh, he did not. Um, and so what essentially happened was, we're not sure exactly how this case came to be. I suspect it might have been the bug bounty firm saying, hey, you'd originally told us that you had a bug bounty budget of 100000 but you just made us pay a couple of dudes a million dollars. Something ain't right here. And they wanted to avoid what happened next, which is this indictment. And there's another major, major point in this indictment. So he, Joseph Sullivan isn't charged under a computer misuse act statute or even the traditional wire fraud that we see as a common, uh, as a common element to cybercrime. He's charged by, uh, with two things, obstruction of justice, okay? And something called misprison by felony. Now, misprison by felony is a very, very interesting charge. Misprison by felony is essentially you witness a crime and you don't report it. And so by not reporting it to the SEC or the FTC becomes a criminal matter. Not reporting the data beach and attempting to cover it up becomes a criminal matter. All right. So let that sink in. The reason why this is so important, this case is, is that if the the court decides that indeed there was uh, his actions, uh, he knew there was a crime, he covered up that crime, he obstructed justice by saying there was no crime, you guys don't know what you're talking about, and he didn't disclose honestly um, to the FTC, this will have huge repercussions because uh, as a criminal statute, which this is under, um, he ends up potentially facing three years in jail, but the biggest thing is civil forfeiture and restitution. So all of a sudden you have these high-flying executives who have conspired potentially. And see, to have a conspiracy, you need another party other than just him and the CEO. Interesting to note that the CEO has not been charged, that um, it's quite possible the CEO turned on Joseph in order to strengthen this FBI investigation, which led to this um, indictment, pure speculation on my part. But when you're in the hot seat and you could lose the mansions and the boats and all the cars and quite possibly the mistress and the wife all at the same time, you're now in this position where civil forfeiture is actually more impactful than criminal time. Uh, you know, because if you've got, you know, several million dollars stashed away in a bunch of houses and shell accounts, three years in jail to get out scot-free and enjoy the good things in life is a small price to pay. But to have it all taken away and spend three years in jail is maybe this double sledgehammer wielding barbarian that we need in order to start having some people starting to conduct themselves accordingly. Because with all of these ransom cases, the argument could be made, it's not a hard argument to make, that a crime has taken place and you are not reporting it. And that, my friends, could be the ball game. Perfect, Ian, thank you for that. Any of the guys want to chip in there or should we move on? We're good. I just want to say, yeah, a, a NDA to criminals. Yeah, and they sign them with their uh, with their hacker aliases too. That's the hilarious thing, right? I mean, you're going to try and use a legal tool against folks that are already demonstrably criminals. It's insane. Wow, wow. All right, thanks, chaps. <clears throat> Who loves drama? John loves drama. John loves drama. Joe, yeah, talk bro, to us about no, 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 no. <laughs> and and drop and maybe if if uh, if it's not too much to ask, John, can you drop the latest lame joke live here on the beer farmers later on on the show? I will Ooh. do. I will do. When you guys are talking, I will try to uh, post. <laughs> so Twitter drama. Um, you don't. You don't seem to get. You can't get through a day, John, can you, without seeing something happening? Well, it depends, but but the. What what bothers me is, is that 
not that everyone has an opinion, but the fact that that's at least that's that's so I I I perceive it. It's that it's sometimes it's it seems that I I post something for me it's trivial, innocent, and then then I get drama. But you get used to that, and I can almost predict when I get drama is a big word. I get uh, emotional reactions. Let's call it like that. But but what 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 bothers me a bit is about if you get this kind of conversations that people are jumping on and using their for instance their 60,000 followers to to uh, boost something and just turn it into a whole other uh, discussion and and that's when it when when it gets heavy i mean you you get all the feedback your your tweet was well meant i'm a bel i'm a belgian so my english is okay but i'm not not all the nuances so sometimes i know when i tweet something and then people are really understanding because when i write blogs etc people almost never criticize me because of yeah, wrong grammar etc., whatever but when i write a tweet and there's one word that's that it's possible to interpret it will be <laughs> if it gets if the tweet gets a lot of attention i hate that and and the other drama or or don't I don't know if it's always drama. There's a lot of, of, like I said, high profile Twitter users jumping on the bandwagon. I try to mute as much. Certain words that, that cause dramas, certain yeah people that are always like stirring in the, I don't know how to say it, but you know what I mean? Always, I, I try to mute that because it, it, it must be a yeah, pleasant experience. Twitter for me is, is learning and fun, but recently, the learning is a lot less, but but it's also a bit personal, I think, because yeah, I'm trying to get as much time off Twitter as possible, and one of the things is the lame jokes I started, <laughs> just to get, bring some positivity. And See. even then, even then, there's a cultural difference, and I, that's the last thing I want to say about a, a joke, which is in Belgium, people would laugh about it, but has a certain. It's about women, for instance, and yeah, you could interpret it as sexist. And then the, when I tweeted, I thought, oh no, what have I done? I deleted it afterwards. And here in Belgium, everyone would laugh, but, but it's a cultural thing. I can, can tweet the same thing about all topics, or I can make, make jokes in Belgium that would be possible. So sometimes I, I feel like, yeah, don't go there, even with the jokes. Uh, so it, it's a thin line between meant to be funny and uh, yeah people that uh, interpret so, things so john in a 24-hour period how many times do you lose do you leave twitter and then come back no i know <laughs> what you're referring to but um where, honestly, where people I, I, peace out they call the community toxic and they're like i'm done and then three hours yeah, but, later but, but, they're but, back but, online it's true, but but when I read it, sometimes it's it's like really shit. If people are going to to tell you about that you're not contributing, etc., that's regardless of of which which uh, who it is. I, I don't care if, if if someone tells me and then yeah, you suck because of blah blah blah, and, and there's no no reason, or they they call me out about the blog post and they have no real literally no arguments, <laughs> and and then they they saying exactly all the things I explained in the blog post and they're like giving all these arguments, which I try to discuss in a nuanced way in the blog. So I get what the people, but, but the thing is I, I, I try to just don't give them attention. I think a lot of people should better do that and don't give the attention. And when you go offline, go offline and take some rest because saying I go offline, <laughs> you, you, you create even more stress. And then you, of course they come back because Twitter is a good medium after all. I mean, just filter out the negativity and, and enjoy and learn from from great people and that's what's what's about i think yeah absolutely scott sean <laughs> sean <laughs> scott go ahead. I, was, I was gonna let scott go scott you go because you haven't talked much well it's because i'm usually the target for some of the drama recently <laughs> um no drama is nothing new to me and i I get where John's coming from and this is something I'm absolutely trying to do is actually step back from a lot of stuff where it goes on because I'm kind of like the young version of Captain America. I can keep going. You know, I've got tweet deck running. I'm just going to keep responding to people over and over again, especially if your point is bullshit. The problem with that is 
sometimes, and this is what I've noticed recently, is people have taken to blocking you, then subtweeting you or quote tweeting you out of context or taking a screen cap, tweeting that out of context to their 60,000 followers. Um, not that follower count matters much, but when you're being amplified in a bastardized fashion to the entire world in a different way, let's take John's joke, for example. Well men was a lame joke of the day, just went out, wasn't really meant to cause any offense. Someone could have just went, hey, you know, that doesn't actually, you know, gel well with, you know, the English speaking community. In a DM. Yeah, yeah on, in a DM. On the public drama. Uh, we, without the public drama, we've seen this before with uh, uh, Dan Card, for example, where, you know, it could have all been resolved behind closed doors. And I'm sure he would have turned around and said, yep, not a problem. I didn't realize this. I was doing it really, really quickly job done um unfortunately when it's it's been used to amplify some sort of weird bastardized stigma or point that you have and the the irony for me is most of the people that i end up arguing with are the people that actually say that infosec is toxic and a dumpster fire and we need to be more positive but yet their entire feeds are all just fucking negative bullshit and I'm sitting there the entire time going, you do realize how ironic this is. You are the very people that are saying it's a dumpster fire. You can change that by not eviscerating me purely because I disagreed with you on a very valid disagreement point. Like, oh, what happened to the community being all about disagreements? We argue all the time. We disagree with each other all the time. It doesn't make us enemies. We don't just suddenly go, you are my mortal enemy block on all social media platforms. We go, okay, don't agree with you there. Or even better, explain, where are you coming from? What, what's your point? You know, where's your evidence of that? Okay, cool. I don't agree with you, but that's fine. And then we just move on to talking about something Ian's said or done. It's usually me. Sure. Yeah. And I think reflecting back on the, on the number of events like has been described, <clears throat> just try and calculate, you can't, but try and calculate the amount of mental energy and physical energy that have been wasted in dealing with these situations. I mean, it's an unfathomable amount of time that gets wasted and energy that could be used, like you say, Scott, in a more positive fashion, discussing real problems. So uh, one thing I will say, though, is when you do have a legitimate problem and you need the community to help bring attention to that problem, the community has been very successful. You know, Ollie, um, uh, one of our security researchers and his uh, chief names, where we got a lot of amplification, we got the attention of uh, cheap names and they came to the table and, and finally took down a whole bunch of active, uh, attack sites that they, that they had allowed to be registered and allowed criminal activity to take place. So, you know, the, the, there are some good aspects to the community. And I think that should be pointed out that, you know, through fundraising, uh, uh, you know, amplification of, of positive um, things that are going on, I think it works really well. But then we get to this slide, Mike, and walk us through this slide, because I love it. This is exactly what we're talking about. It's a, a sanitized example, really, of what you do tend to see quite a lot of. So somebody makes a an honest opinion or declares a preference for one thing above the other, and then a random will wander in out of nowhere and, and eviscerate, to use um, Scott's word, and probably leave the original poster feeling pretty shit and wondering what the hell it was they did wrong. And we do see this a lot. And you can trans, you can replace some of the wording in the in this example for infosec stuff, or views about politics, or views about other things, and that is the exact result that you tend to find. Mm -hmm. and it happens a lot. It happens all of the time. And sometimes, and I'm not the only person here that opens Twitter up in the morning and just thinks, "Fuck it, turn it off. Come back again later in the day." Yeah, yeah. And I do that a lot, and that's what it feels like. At times, <laughs> toxic waste dump. Toxic waste dump. <laughs> no, this, this, this is a yeah. perfect slide though, because it's the, this is this is exactly it. That we are putting that shit into the planet and then complaining the planet is dying. <laughs> like we are creating our own mountain of shit. Like let's just stop. I mean, Ian's point about you know some positivity in the community. Take ten minutes. Just stop and think, and just go. Hey, do you know what? This isn't worth it. De deal with it via DM. Sleep on it, or just do what Mike does and just go fuck Twitter for today. I'm not dealing with it. That is probably the best thing. If we're just constantly, 
you, I mean, you can't be complaining about the environment while you're like literally dumping the orange goop into the atmosphere. Like, it just doesn't work. Exactly right. All right, another thing that we tend to see a lot of <clears throat> is the rise of the vendor bash. And um, TikTok's a good example of this. So we're all generally a little bit unhappy about how vendors or providers such as Facebook and Google and Twitter and so on and so forth may or may not use your personal data for various different marketing and advertising campaigns. Um, we know that that actually happens. Um, I think, John, you told a really funny joke about it. It was to do with somehow checking your phone to see what you'd been taught, which brand you'd spoken about yesterday. And, yeah. it, and that was kind totally. of a really cool joke. That, that's that's not a joke. <laughs> yes, it's, it's, it's Or true. is it? That it's, uh, yeah. Is it true or not? A lot of people, I see it. I saw it uh, the last few days. Uh, several people were tweeting. Yeah, I spoke about something, you know, uh, very typical. And then next day, it's in, in, in my ads on Facebook or, or Twitter or yeah. whatever. So I, I've had that experience too. And as we're all aware, during lockdown, certainly there, there has been a significant uptick in the usage of certain apps. And this particular platform, Zoom, is a perfect example of a massive ramp up of usage um, during the COVID crisis. And similarly with TikTok, and that's for kids and adults alike using TikTok to, to share information and communicate. Um, and, a, and guess what happened? Everybody went, ah, oh, it's a Chinese company. They're obviously stealing all your personal data for various different political, or military or industrial reasons. And we hear it all the time. Now, a good friend of ours, Elliot Alderson, or F Society, you may know him on Twitter, he did some extensive research into TikTok and actually found that they are operating in no worse a fashion. That's not necessarily great, but they're not operating in any worse fashion than some of the American social media giants, such as Facebook, such as Twitter. They're only collecting similar types of information. There is no evidence to su support the accusations, mostly on social media, funnily enough, ironically, that um, TikTok is somehow mishandling data. And again, it's a bit of history repeat itself. Every time a new platform rocks up, Zoom being the example again, people get on it and trash it. Oh, your security is shit. You shouldn't be using the platform. And um, who was the company in that Zoom bought really early doors? Keybase? Yep, Keybase, uh, because people were demanding end-to-end -end encryption. Um, and it was really interesting because um, as much as uh, the audience and, and folks wanted to demand end-to-end -end encryption, there was a concern that end-to-end -end encryption would prevent uh, legal investigations into child exploitation being conducted by Zoom. So, you know, there was an orchestrated effort that, you know, end-to-end -end decryption was going to be like, we need this because we're the good guys and we want to keep our stuff secret. Well, when you build a feature, that feature can be abused, right? And it's naive to think that that isn't a realistic threat model. So Zoom had to be very careful about how they went about um, this, you know, uh, especially when they have a freemium offer where you can use a free account uh, with very little uh, account validation and, and or um, I would say auth authentic, uh, authenticity, so. I just want to add to Zoom and end-to-end -end encryption. So firstly, Zoom, the security was lacking initially. Agreed. I will, give, I will, John. I will yeah. give that, but the important thing is they, they like basically took like three months and said, we're just going to entirely focus on security. And they deserve full credit for that. A lot of companies could learn a lot from that. And the result of that is they now have a pretty strong and secure platform. The other thing about end-to-end -end encryption is it's becoming, in a sense, marketing gov. Um, yeah. Take WhatsApp, for example, end-to-end -end encryption. Okay, great. But how do you think your messages get synced when you log in from another device? Your key is stored somewhere within the platform. Yeah, it has right. to be. So the whole notion of NTN -end encryption, technically it is, but there is a way for others to maybe decrypt it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And Garmin, what was the other example with these guys? Similar sort of story. Yeah. Well, you know, it, here is a giant company uh, making an awful lot of money, uh, decides to collect a whole bunch of personal data from people uh, using apps for running and for outdoor adventuring. Uh, they get pasted 
uh, with ransomware. We think it was Evil Corp with Wasted Locker. Um, they pay a $10 million ransom. And going back to, I think it was Sean's earlier point um, about, you know, it's easier to pay the parking ticket, especially when you've been paying premiums to an insurance company for years or months. Uh, it's kind of like buying your parking ticket in advance. It gets better. And, they get that? a tax. They're, I think they got a tax rebate from it. Yeah, um, it's it's quite possible they did as well. Yeah. Um, now and and then possibly a bailout under COVID. Um, so so here's a problem because Garmin just basically gave the entire internet a fuck you by paying ten million to a country where these guys are operating in. So let's assume it's all it's Russia, where ten million U.S. dollars turns into about seventy million U.S. dollars worth of development for the next version of Wasted Locker. These people and universities and hospitals that have not learned from the countless uh, warnings and alerts sent out by every government agency about this threat and how to mitigate this threat, which is have backups, okay, that are stored offline so that the bad guys can't get at it. All of a sudden, we are continuing to go down the road. And because of the cyber insurance industry, we're kind of seeing this uptick in the amount of money available. And, and I, I made a joke in another presentation that part of the new ransomware will be a questionnaire before the ransomware hit saying, essentially, how much cyber insurance do you have? Because we'll now calculate um, your ransom based on <laughs> your policy holding. So, so this is a, a very sad state of affairs, and, and currently, again, from a justice perspective, from a regulatory perspective, you know, we don't have the kind of teeth to deal with this type of scenario to hold the, co the, the companies accountable. We have two systems so far that haven't worked particularly well. One is the class action, which takes way too long and moves itself ponderously slow and takes an extraordinary amount of money to get any sort of justice out of these organizations. And uh, Marriott, uh, the annual data breach um, company, um, they, they have recently been um, a, a subject to a class action uh, lawsuit. But can, can, um, uh, consumer advocacy groups, consumer protection groups, need to get a hold of this because it's just completely unacceptable. There's a duty of care to safeguard this data and really nothing is being done to ensure that insurance isn't used as a loophole to pay these ransoms. Not that I have a strong opinion on this shit at all. No, of course you don't, clearly. But the other important point, I think, around um, it's cyber insurance is it doesn't cover you for any kind of legal or authority action. So if you receive a high fine from, for example, the Financial Services Authority or Financial Conduct Authority or the ICO, you can't rely on your cyber insurance to pay that fine because it won't cover you for it. Mm -hmm. It's a really important point. John, did you want to say something? Yeah, yeah. Uh, the GDPR, in a certain sense, has, has the opposite effect. Not the, It's good that, that, that they get uh, sanctioned, but also a lot of ransomware attacks are data breaches now. It was debatable before, but now, all, all, anyway, when it's against the big companies, bigger companies, it's it's with extortion, so with leaking the data. So we're talking about a data breach, yeah. and then uh, again, the the fact that GDPR has certain fines that can be uh, yeah, given to the companies makes that the criminals yeah, will just ask more ask more money as well mm -hmm. so it's, it's a good and a bad thing and miko hippone talked about it several years before even before the gdpr um, was in place and, and it's true i think maybe it's only a slight uh, increase and then there are other factors that that make the amounts a lot higher but i think gdpr in certain sense has an impact as well so um, agreed sean did you have a point mate yeah, I just wanted to add, like, pay, closer to Ian's point, but making that clearer, um, paying ransomware is literally funding the criminals. Yeah, like, 100%. as soon as you pay pay their farm, guess what? I've got a bunch of money. So we'll hire more developers. Yeah.
yeah but but if you pay if you don't pay the criminals and and you don't have a choice you could very well could be end of the game <laughs> certainly for for yeah, some companies but, uh, but this goes back to a point that you know as appsec bloke and as sean and yourself working in the application space the tools out there to ensure that the code being used for the website doesn't have vulnerabilities that that should be part of a qa process it should be part of a security assessment and review process the, the I, I would suspect, and I don't know this for sure because I haven't seen a technical report on Garmin, and we may never see a technical report on Garmin, but when we look at the OWASP top 10, when we look at the lack of CSP and SRI on websites, I mean, these are just like these services that are being stuck out there on the internet, and nobody seems to give a shit about whether or not they can be vulnerable and they can be attacked. Agreed. And it's not just the app space either, and it's infrastructure too, you know, yeah. so there is still too much infrastructure being built well, but, but, in an unsafe fashion out there. A lot of companies are at the very low maturity level uh, with regard to security. And then you can fix, obviously, the, the big uh, the big holes by doing uh, penetration tests, etc., vulnerability network scans. But but there's more to it. You have to start with the basics and with the security uh, development yeah. life cycle and, and these kind of things. Otherwise, yeah, it, it will happen over over and over again. And then... I just want to make one point on this uh, this last issue. So if you look at the uh, APT group that we track at Sidejax um, called uh, Twisted Kitten, uh, they go by a variety of different uh, kitten, be, referring to Iranian operatives. The Iranians have gotten really good from a disclosure of a proof of concept, a POC, if you will, um, for a vulnerability in infrastructure. And within seven days, they are made a, a commercial exploit for those vulnerabilities that are dropped. So they've attacked uh, the VPN vulnerability, Citrix, and currently they're smashing F5. Uh, load balancers, and before that, they were doing RDP uh, boxes that were unpatched. So, so the ability of these cyber criminals to exploit these vulnerabilities um, kind of makes a joke out of a vulnerability management program. If you're looking at it every couple of months, whereas in seven days, you know the vulnerability is weaponized and tearing across the internet. So, yeah, absolutely right. And this slide is not directly connected to what we've just been speaking about but it's an example really of um again where somebody's got an idea in their head about malpractice at a, a global organization uh, the example here is when bloomberg reported that super micro the chinese motherboard manufacturer was inserting um in quotes grain of rice sized chip that contained a backdoor to beijing yeah. and that was absolute nonsense and they claimed that um that intel were consuming this technology apple was consuming the technology and the mm -hmm. and they are the, obviously the biggest players in terms of hardware manufacturing and both of those organizations came out and said no that's just bullshit it's not even true and correct me if i'm wrong i believe bloomberg are still running this story so yeah, they, they haven't later. retracted their assumptions and they're not wrong that's the problem um, so when you look at um, a, mo a motherboard and a BIOS and the IDAC and, and the CPU itself, especially an older generation CPU that has Spectre vulnerabilities, if, if you take the view that the computer hardware stack from the motherboard on up, and if you've got like a Broadcom built-in uh, network card, you can make the argument that there's vulnerabilities that could be exploited by China or some other actor to take over that computer at the BIOS or at the firmware level or, or further up the, the boot cycle, as we saw about a month ago with this vulnerability in uh, the boot firmware, um, uh, signing certificates for the boot firmware. So, so the problem is, is that Bloomberg took something and essentially got, I think, really um, needed to explain it in simple terms that the general public could understand. Um, and so they invented the idea that this was like a grain of rice, uh, uh, you know, that, that is being physically pushed into every motherboard. 
That's preposterous, as we know, and it's bullshit. But us in information security should realize that vulnerability is, is across the spectrum, right? It goes from, you know, each component potentially has a vulnerability. And, and I think where they really shit the bed was they weren't um, clear and attempted to take something and sensationalize it to, to gain a lot of social media, to gain a lot of like views of the report. Um, when we all know that there's tons of vulnerabilities in the platforms that we use every day, ranging from CPU uh, predictive stuff like Spectre and uh, what was the other one, Meltdown? Yeah. Or is that just me having a meltdown? No, meltdown. you're right. Yeah. Um, so, so, you know, when you, when you contextualize it, they're trying to take all of these vulnerabilities and poke the finger and say, you know, this is the reason. When we all know it's much more complex than that. And, and so poor journalism, poorly executed, poor editorializing, sensationalizing. I think they're guilty of all those charms, but they're still at the same time, they're not wrong. Mm. But I think there's a term for it, isn't it? And it's FUD, fear, uncertainty and doubt. Completely, yeah. And, and that's what we, we tend to see time after time, from uh, certainly from a lot of the media and government. <clears throat> All right. Oh, yeah. Let's talk about the, the alleged skill shortage <laughs> in, in information security. So who wants to have a chat about that? I'd, I'd like to have a stab initially. Go. So I think people are looking at this as the industry as a whole, and you can't do that. My view is, yes, there is a skill shortage in some areas, and there's not in others. So I know in like application security, trying to find someone with a development background as well as security is pretty difficult. It, it took us a while to get some people. In my current role, that took a, a while to find someone um, to fill that role. Um, but there are other areas out there where there's, there's quite a few people um, that are available and there's not. So we, we need to stop saying InfoSec has a skills shortage it different areas do stop focusing on the industry as a whole that's just my view i agree uh, my two cents is that i think less than having a skill shortage we rather more have um an, a recruitment competence shortage in so far as organizations that are not necessarily security companies find it incredibly difficult to craft job descriptions and adverts that actually are realistic and I'll take Windian's memory back a year or two when you shared with us an approach I think you received on LinkedIn or some such platform where somebody was looking for um, a unicorn. And the unicorn was an analyst, um, an engineer, an architect, a compliance officer, and a head of security all rolled into one person here. And you remember that one? Oh, I mean, man. Yeah, it was just the most ridiculous thing that I've ever seen. And we've seen um, some other stuff. I mean, IBM dropped a whopper where they wanted somebody with what was it, uh, 10 years of Kubernetes experience and <laughs> Kubernetes was invented like four years ago. <laughs> so, you know, it is it is totally true. I, I'll support both uh, with, with what Sean has to say and, and what you had to say. I'm going to go one further and I'm going to say this is a government policy problem. This is making the right investments and encouraging people to go into STEM. And if there is truly a skill shortage, government policy needs to step up to the table. And I'll tell you this right now. There are a lot of developers available in other countries and the uh, government's uh, concerns with regards to visas um, and not making um, our tech market available to those uh, developers. We've just proved through this pandemic that a lot of us knowledge workers are capable of providing value and staying on track with projects um, by working from home and working remotely. You don't have to be in the UK. The only reason, you know, we, we are stuck within these geographical boundaries has to do more with tax and, um, and, and understanding, you know, uh, what the various levels of education are in the different countries. And, you know, we, we see this and it's like the government is, is talking at us with two, two messages. They're saying, we want the tech industry to grow. We need the tech industry to grow. The tech industry is the engine of our modern economy. 
But at the same time, it's like, hey, can we get an extra 10 million to um, fund uh, more computer science classes, more hands-on networking? Can we subsidize uh, testing and certification? No, we don't have the money available for that, right? So it's like, guys, either put up or shut up because we're in an era now where those jobs can go somewhere else. Companies can be located in the UK and outsource all of their development to Poland, Estonia, Iran, anywhere. Well, not Iran. I'm in <laughs> India. Yeah, Iran would be a bad idea. Scott, John, anything to add? Uh, my my two cents are just literally, I've seen someone tweet about this only two days ago about getting through the HR barrier to get to, to an interview with a technical person and be able to explain the skill set they can bring and what they can do. And it is very much like, and I've worked in companies as well, where you have either an internal HR department or even worse, an external one that is using copy-paste templates based on other companies with other criteria. And they've just they've just meshed all this together and all of a sudden you're looking for unicorns and when you actually show up to the job interview you're going this isn't actually what I was promised as a candidate yeah. but also the hiring manager sitting there going wow you actually have experience for a role we wanted did you not apply for it yeah but I got the note back from the company well why well because I didn't have 25 exp years experience in Kubernetes that's a shitty manager though Scott yeah and I see this all the time this is where you know what if you're hiring a technical role and you're the hiring manager you tell HR uh, send me all the resumes and spend the time and go through them to get the skills you want HR doesn't know the technical nuances they probably don't even know whether you're an open source shop or a, or a Microsoft shop right and and so if you're that manager you need to take charge of this because you'll get exactly what Scott said. You'll get somebody that's either completely overqualified or completely unsuitable. Yeah. All right, we should go to John for this one, man. <laughs> John, I mean, what the fuck the is thought, an influencer? The thought leader himself. <laughs> um, yeah, what is it actually? Is an influencer someone who tweets and mentions like 10 people and hashtags <laughs> every word? You know, <laughs> first of all, influencers to me are a good thing the real influencers talking about people that influenced me into diving deeper into application security the troy hunts of this world and, uh, and others so that's a great thing but the good thing about these guys is that they're not yeah they share a lot but they're, they're not looking to influence and and, and just get re retweets and then likes and they build a profile they post good stuff where you can learn from there was, I think it was last year, I, when your following grows a little bit, you get a lot of emails for, can you promote this and this and blah, blah, blah. One of the things was uh, Lenovo. Lenovo uh, uh, think shield and there was a secur security solution. And uh, the point was, I mentioned these influencers. You, I, probably if you're an uh, Active on Twitter, you notice these patterns. They, they're like a retweet machine and they're starting to add, mention you as well and hope that you start retweeting. And it's like they have 50,000 followers, but they also follow 50,000 people. And it's just all about the numbers and about yeah, one bunch of, of yeah, blur. I, I never read it. I never click on these links because obviously that's the opposite effect with me and then with the think shield thing and they got an email there was the new yeah magic solution if you have lenovo think shield yeah you're unhackable uh but it's not that you could test it or write a review and they approached me and it was like yeah we uh, it's a paid um yeah, promotion and and then I was like I, I didn't even react and then a few days later I saw these people just tweeting that I knew they couldn't have tested it. They were like tweeting. They recorded videos where they say how amazing it is. Just probably all instructed by Lenovo. And it was not even, yeah, you could, from see it, you know that they are not doing it for free, but it's never, no one, they don't say it's a paid promotion we do for Lenovo. And it was so shady. And then they were called out by some, <laughs> some uh, real high profile uh, followers. and. That, that's my entire point about that. Just be genuine. Don't retweet things you don't know about. And if you don't know, just say you don't know. Or you you are not, you can't be an influencer. Yeah, you can be an influencer, but you can't create that. Just learn. And if you, influencing for me is, is 
two people that tell you, well, your blog, that was amazing. And I learned something from that. I liked that. Uh, uh, that's influencing at a really small scale. And if that's influencing, yeah, that's great. But, and if you reach more people, the be- the more, the better, but not like this. So that was my rant about influencers between quotes. Yeah, that's great, John. I think, I think you've co- you've covered pretty much everything there. We're in, inside our last ten minutes of the talk, so we'll we'll move on. But thanks, John, for that. I think that was pretty cool. Um, yeah, you know, we see this year in year out again. You know, vendors, and you just kind of spoke about it there with ThinkShield, and it's the next thing that's going to fix everybody's problems. And you should love it because it's next gen or artificial intelligence. I'm, I'm going to say quantum proof just because it's Sean's idea. Um, we st- we still seen unhackable. There haven't been too many claims of unhackable this year, which has been good. I think quite a few vendors have perhaps learned from the bitfies of previous years and decided not to use the word. Um, we see the word entropy being used a lot, and I think I wouldn't even want to dream of describing entropy to a non-technical person. So we should probably stop bandying that term and others like it around. Um, and that, that's really my take on it. Year in, year out, we see the same thing. Our product will fix every problem that you have, even the ones that you haven't thought of yet. And it does become a little boring after a while. So I don't know. Anybody want to quickly think, add? I still think artificial intelligence uh, versus machine learning, uh, two completely different things. Um, marketing has decided that AI is the future. Um, AI has a really, really tough time in a lot of scenarios and a lot of learning scenarios. Um, so, you know, I don't think there's um, a, 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 a entity uh, out there that we can truly point at and say this is an artificial intelligence. Um, I don't think it's been invented yet, and I think it's completely overused and abused. Agreed. And because you would think that any anything that's claiming to be artificial intelligence in today's world would have, have to have taken its initial instruction from a human. A shameless plug. I started a GitHub page. It's oh. a page on GitHub um, that contains all these terms and why they the rubbish. And my my whole idea behind this is let's let's try help some of these marketing departments so they can look to this and see, hey, why is this a bad idea? Um, we're gonna we were gonna use it. Maybe we should think about it before we actually do it. So rather than just trying to do a dumb pile on and and that, let's see if we can help them. So. That's the idea behind it. Shilling. (laughs) Shilling. Yeah. But on on the subject of entropy, though, I mean, that that brings us on nicely to the next slide, where we're just all fighting about the same shit constantly. How many Twitter experts have you seen fighting about password entropy? In a user's thread where they're like, hey, use three random words, to a random, a, a total, what I would call a normie, who does not give a shit about entropy, and they're using their dog's name, Fido2, as their, their bloody password. And someone says, hey, you should probably use three random words, which is a good step forward. And then there's all these experts coming in, arguing the toss about entropy. Fuck off. It's Fine. totally useless. Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? And, and we see it with passwords. We see it with um, HTTPS certificates, TLS. Um, should we patch? Shouldn't we patch? If we should patch, which I think we should do, then how frequently should we do it? Um, and then, and then recently, I put a tweet poll out around which certificates, as in certifications, are the right ones for a, a security professional to be looking at. And I did it kind of cheekily because CISSP CISP just about won that that poll. Um, but two years ago, everybody was hating on it. It was pointless and nobody should get involved with it and people should do uh, the CompTIA stuff. Um, and then once upon a time, the CEH, the Certified Ethical Hacker thing, was new and everybody thought it was a great entry point. And then three years later, everybody hated on it and said it was a complete waste of time. And that that does two things, really. One is it kind of it takes a shit on the people that have spent a lot of time and in some cases a lot of money in doing these courses because they had it on good um good information that they were the right thing to do and the second thing is it leaves them completely confused that they're they've completely focused a years of their life on the wrong cert on the wrong learning path and i think we need to get better at deciding on what the right approaches are um very quickly and i know you're a CompTIA faculty member do you want to just say a quick 
20 seconds yeah. on something? It's, it's really simple. In fact, um, uh, Trident Search, who is a great um, uh, partner in the community, um, always looking for CTI people for us and, and stuff like that. Um, they asked me, what, Ian, what do you think of CERTs? And I said, CERT plus experience equals success. Experience alone can bring you success, but it actually narrows where you can take your uh, career. But the most important thing about the cert is understanding the language. I, if you tell me that you've been on three certification courses, but you never got around to writing the exams, that's okay. I mean, sure, I, maybe you should have written the exam, but life happens, shit happens, people run out of money, whatever. But at least I know that when I talk to you about a technical subject like a firewall or a proxy or DNS, you'll know what the hell that is, right? And so I think the cert maybe just gives you a commonality of communication and language. And it's not necessarily like, you know, I, I, it shouldn't be treated, in my opinion, as an exclusivity. Just because you don't, you don't have a CISSP doesn't mean you can't do a security role, right, in an organization. And getting back to Scott's point is that, um, you know, if HR is screening and has pile one CISSP and pile two no CISSP, then that's a huge problem because you might miss some really valuable, really experienced people in that pile that never got around to doing the cert or never had the economic uh, capabilities of doing the cert. Yeah, cool. Okay, we're into the last few slides now. And uh, this is just a quick example of uh, companies that think that they're bulletproof and they've spent a large amount of money on their security posture and it couldn't possibly be broken through and an arrow through the front of your, your helmet. Oh, sir. Yeah, and fatal. fatal. <laughs> <clears throat> and we are still arguing about the same issues and that really slide is just to remind everybody of everything that we've just said. Okay. You know, Mike, I think invading Russia is a great idea. <laughs> <laughs> it's coming up to winter but there is some good stuff happening okay yeah. so we want to end the the presentation really on a on a, on a high note Com communities do continue to thrive and new ones spring up all the time and you know i can think of security queens being a great example of that um the many hats club have been around for a long time i think they've got about eight thousand members now in there and that's a, a quite broad spectrum of people across all disciplines of security um you may have, well, you may be familiar with InfoSec Happy Hour, which is a, a little thing that Sean came up with back in March, and we kind of took it on to the next level and turned it into a weekly Friday evening virtual pub, which was brilliant, and it really made, it, it gave people an opportunity to come together that wouldn't normally have got any time with each other and forge friendships and really lasting friendships. And I think that's been the real the real win for InfoSec Happy Hour. The beer farmer stepped away from it last week as a thing. It's now in the hands of a capable bunch of people that are going to run forward with it. But we hope- Follow them be, on Twitter. Uh, they have a Twitter, Twitter account. Twitter. Yeah, they do. They, we never had a Twitter account for Happy Hour. There is one now. We'll continue to be involved in it, but it, it's it's gone from strength to strength. And Scott kindly produced that graphic, which gives you an idea of the kind of numbers of people that we had in, involved in that. And it was great. And again, you know, unlikely friendships are made, cross-border friendships, you know, friendships around the planet have been made. And that's been incredibly heartwarming for me at a time when people have been really down and struggling with maybe mental health issues, even physical health and happy hour and things like happy hour and other things do exist have just made life a little bit more bearable in the time that we've been, you know, in things like lockdown and stuff like that. And we do need to break out of the echo chamber. We've talked about it a lot, about the arguing and the fact that we, we all agree with each other or we all disagree with each other, but we need to break out of the bubble and start taking the information out to the people that matter, which are the users out there. And whether that's your enterprise users or your friends and family using social media, we need to be getting these messages to those people. And that's something we all need to take away and think about going forward as to how we stop patting each other on the back endlessly and actually go out there to the world and make the internet a more secure place for the average person that's making use of it. And act as exemplars, yeah. Shout it from the rooftops. Let's get out there and spread the good word, yeah, and actually add value to what it is that we're here to do. So, yeah, pay attention and learn from the things that have gone on in the past. We've given you plenty of examples of where history has repeated itself and we've not moved on from it. Be really careful on social media. 
if it's a battle you don't want to get involved in, then don't be tempted to get involved in it because it can ruin your day. Do what I do and what John's increasingly doing, which is take a break from the social media, come back when you're feeling a little bit fresher. Um, be respectful of others. There are people that know a shitload more about things than you do, so be mindful of that. And there are, and you know a shitload more about things than other people do. So everybody knows nobody's the same. We're all different, and we've all got different anxieties and aspirations. Let's try and break out of this cycle of talking about the same things all the time and start innovating with some of our thinking and action. And then again, remember who it is that we're dealing with. We're dealing with people that are out there that are not necessarily technically savvy, but have got every right to be secure and have every right to privacy when they're operating online. And we just about kept it in time, guys. Just about. Um, so thank you very much if you if you were here and listened and watched on our various channels. Thank you very much indeed to um, Sam and Ben and Phil, the organisers of the conference, for having us on. It's been a real pleasure. And um, if you want to follow us or unfollow us, mute, block and report us on Twitter, then that's the way you go about doing it. And thank you very much for your time. I think we haven't got time for questions, but if you want to contact us, then, you know, use our Twitter handles and drop us a line. I'm sure we'll be more than happy to answer any questions that you've got. So thank you very much, and I'll hand you back to Sam.